You may remain seated if you'd like. You may remain seated. But uh, we'll wait for the music to cut off. If you noticed, uh, we had a little bit of Mona Lisa playing. And, uh, um, oh, what's the other one? Uh, then goes uh, Sorry, Sorry Night. So we're trying to get uh, the music theme to uh, coordinate with our program today. Um, but you may be seated at this time. So. I guess the first thing I'm going to say is, if you haven't heard already, uh, that Queen Elizabeth has uh, passed away. And uh, thinking about our, our British Rotarians and uh, uh, their sorrow for losing uh, an incredible uh, person, queen, representative of our country, actually, to some degree, the world, amazing figure, um, and we should uh, honor her in our in our own ways today so we'll start with music with uh, david rogers thank you president rick fellow rotarians uh, today is a number of days national pardon day among other things but also virgin mary day and i thought in that spirit i would share a performance of the famous Ave Maria by the French composer Charles Gounod, which uses the Bach keyboard prelude as an accompaniment, but performed here by cellist Yo-Yo Ma and not on piano, the incredible Bobby McFerrin. did. So I didn't know what to say, so I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Leanne, very much. So I'd like to uh, welcome our guests today. Do we have some guests? If I know you just sat down. I'm sorry to do this to you, but if you are a guest today, would you stand and be recognized so that we can acknowledge your presence here? I noticed Carter Field stood up, so I don't know if he, it's just because he hasn't been here a while or he wasn't paying attention, but I see you there. <laughs> Sorry, Carter. Uh, okay, last week we had a picnic. We didn't meet uh, here. We had a picnic at Fra Franklin Park. And it was hot, but it didn't keep Rotarians from gathering at the club picnic at Franklin Park for food, fellowship, kids' activities, fun, and pickleball. So I'd like to know, there was, a, there was a picture on the screen kind of rotating through of somebody getting, uh, well, they tried to squirt with a squirt gun, but it looked like it was not hitting. But, um, but raise your hand if you were subjected. In my ear finally came out, but it was fun. We also had a shade squad, fully employed to set up cabanas to help us uh, be comfortable. Uh, and big thank you to Matt Martinkus and Tina Moss, social committee co-chairs, Dan Eliason for food and shade items, Bruce Bacon and son-in-law Thomas Sudbury, who are responsible for the kids' activities, 
Tyler Schultz, I don't see Tyler here, no, okay. Sports Committee Chair and Sig Fossum, who helped with the pickleball activity, and Nancy Leahy and Phil Fossum, who were the on-site pickleball coordinators. John Ball and the Yakima Downtown Association for pro providing shade. So that's a thank you to all those who made the event uh, fun, kept us cool, except for the pickleball players who had to play in the sun, uh, but they were pretty resilient, I have to say. Um, there is an after story. At the end of the picnic, we discovered we had a lot of food left over. We had rice, beans, uh, hot dog buns, and hot dogs. So what did we do with this? Uh, we decided to take it to the uh, Union Gospel Mission. I mean, this is what, 7.30 at night. So my wife Gay and I uh, loaded up in our car and we drove down there, went to the entrance. A uh, person there said, oh, you need to take it to the kitchen. So okay, we went around to the south side of the building, rang the kitchen doorbell, waited, waited, rang it again, no response, no response. So we were thinking, what are we going to do? Well, at that moment, kind of, aha, the gate opened. And out came the, what? Elvis? Was it Elvis? No, no, it was not Elvis. <laughs> but, but it was uh, two, two people who were probably just imp as important at this very moment, driving the outreach van for the Union, Union, uh, Union Gospel Mission, ready to go out to the streets of Yakima and serve the homeless uh, food. I said, hey, we have food. Would you, wh what could we do with it? He says, hey. We'll take it right now. Load up in the back of the van, whoosh, off they went. So, we had a great picnic, but somebody else had a great after party. <laughs> All right, Rotary Operation Harvest. I'll just hold this here. Well, hold this while I go through my remarks here. It's a community-wide food drive. It's a rotary service project. We are a community service club. Seven opportunities for 100% club participation. You can drop off bags on a route between September 30th and October 5th. You can collect food from a route on October 8th. You can work a shift at the collection site. They need 50 volunteers. A club our size can certainly provide 50 volunteers. Participate financially. That's pretty easy. Staple flyers to Operation Harvest Bags. Now that is fun, I have to tell you. I think I did 1,000 of them last year by myself. But it would have been a lot more fun if two or three of us had got to, gotten together and done 3,000. And by the time we finished all the wine, we'd be feeling pretty good and have all, this, all the staples in. Uh, display Operation Harvest signs in your yard or business. So back in the corner, right by the door, just a few feet away from the door as you go out, you could grab one of these signs, and they do have the uh, metal uh, stakes. And you can go home and put it in your, in your yard. Or you call up a relative of a friend and say, hey, would you put one in your yard for, for us from now until Operation Harvest? Make people aware that we're, we're doing this. So as you walk out, pick up a sign, take it home, put it in your yard. Mine's already there. Yours is next. OK. I'll end with, let's rotorize, because that's what we do. All right. Quinn Dallin, introducing a new member. And I'll let her tell us who it is. Oh, Amy, Amy Mabe is also uh, participating too. All right, takes two to do this intro. Yeah. All right. Hello, Rotarians. Thank you, President. Rick and uh, guests. So we are introducing a new member today. Uh, yes, it takes two of us to do this because Sarah is so fantastic. And here's, I got the proof right here. Sarah Watkins grew up in Wisconsin. Anyone been to Wisconsin? Raise a paw. Yeah, it's great. She's the oldest of two children, and her parents were school teachers. So during the summers, her parents would take her and her sibling, brother, 
uh, around the U.S. and they would especially, they sp spent a lot of time in the South seeing historical places and whatnot. She also played basketball. That was a real passion of hers through middle and high school. So she knows her history. She's been around the country and she's a basketball fan. So check box if that matches you, right? Uh, since she is from Wisconsin, Quinn and I asked her the obvious question, and that obvious question is, what's your favorite kind of cheese? And she told us, all cheese curds and pepper jack. And then very quickly, she also named several other types of cheese, many which I have never heard of before, and finally settled on all cheese. I love all cheese. That's my favorite kind. It's all cheese. So she also loves wine. So if you also love wine and or also cheese, be a good opportunity to get together with Sarah and find out more about her, get to know her better. Sarah attended the University of Minnesota. Go. Yeah, gophers, absolutely gophers. Um, for her undergraduate degree where she was a member of the Alpha Chi Omega sorority, which she still serves as the risk manager specialist for that. And then she also went uh, for her law degree to the University of Oregon Go. Oh, yeah, ducks. Uh, she moved to Yakima in 2002 where she worked at the firm now known as little-known firm, Halverson Northwest. Anyone ever hear of that place? And in 2021, Sarah became the first woman to serve as city attorney, not including interim city attorneys. As you can imagine, Sarah is a very good attorney. But when she retires, she would like to be a park ranger. Sarah met her husband, Travis Watkins, who's a sheriff's deputy here in town in Yakima when she signed up to take intro to hiking at Yakima Valley College. Um, one time she missed a class. Obviously, she's a practicing lawyer. She's not taking this class for credit. So one time she missed. And she told the instructor, hey, I missed class. Can you tell me what happened in my absence? And he said, find somebody who took notes. And she thought, who would take notes at an intro to hiking class? Lucky for her, Travis Watkins took notes, and uh, the rest is certainly history. Uh, they then uh, both signed up to take advanced alpine travel, uh, where she learned how to use things like an ice pick and was lowered into a glacier. One of the classes was you got lowered into a glacier, and then you had to make knots on your rope and climb out on your own. Um, so she was getting ready to go down into the glacier next to a young man who was like, oh man, I can't wait to do mountain rescue. This is going to be the best. Like, this is so great. And Sarah's not really looking forward to going into a glacier. So they both go in and then the young man just starts like screaming and freaking out because he's in a glacier on a ledge. So I don't think mountain rescue ended up being his path, but Sarah did very quickly make her knots and get out of there away from the screaming man. So... She loves to travel. The best trip she ever took was to Peru, where she climbed 13,000 feet of Machu Picchu. Now, yeah, wow, that sounds impressive enough, but let me tell you what she did it, and like she had earlier gone to a little convent and made the mistake of drinking coffee at the convent. And then she got violently ill on her trip because the water in the coffee and still climbed 13,000 feet to the top of Machu Picchu. Um, Sarah loves to read. Her favorite book is, the book she thinks everyone should read is Difference Between Us by Raina Grande uh, about her story of crossing the border when she was eight years old. She has to date read like 45 books this year alone, so she is very well read. Um, she is not a stranger to community involved, oh, and I forgot to put this in there, but Sarah has season tickets to the Packers. Yes. <laughs> It's, it's one of her coolest facts. And do you know how long she was on that wait list? 36 years, because her parents signed her up when she was a child. Um, Sarah is not a stranger to community involvement and service. She previously served as the president of Junior League of Yakima. She is most excited about the hands-on service projects Yakima Rotary provides. For example, I've been begging her to become a Rotarian for years, and do you know what was the final straw? I posted a picture of picking up garbage on the Greenway, and she was like, I'm in, I wanna do that. Uh, she will make, yes, she will make a fantastic Rotarian. It is my honor to introduce her to Yakima Downtown Rotary.
Thank you. <laughs> well, Sarah, let me shake your hand and congratulate you on joining this uh, very awesome, robust group who uh, is uh, going to be 100% uh, involved in Operation Harvest. So, sounds like you're ready to go. Ready to go. There might even be some garbage out there too. That you know, you could find too. But anyway, <laughs> we have a whole slew of things to give you as a new member. First, a red badge, which you'll get to turn in for a blue badge after learning a little bit more about uh, Rotary. And then this is how you contact everybody in Rotary, okay. if you want to. And this can go on any wall that you want, home or office or wherever it's allowed. Perfect. And then, of course, the crowning of crowning glory of the Rotary license <laughs> plate holder. You see them all around town. There you Thank go. You. Congratulations. Thanks Welcome aboard. Oh, oh God, I can't get her off the thing. Sorry that this has turned into the Quinn Show. My next announcement is, um, as PR chair, I, um, we have some Rotary swag you can buy and proudly uh, rock the Rotary logo. I'm actually wearing the sweatshirt, cute Rotary symbol, and on the back it says, believe there is good. See, super cute, be the good. And then this shirt is up there too. It says service above self uh, with a rotary symbol here. And you can pick up scarves. Um, I had a couple of people at the picnic be like, where did I get, where can I get the rotarized t-shirt? Good news, right here. So um, Carolyn will email out a link with the tutor tomorrow. You can log in, you can pick your color, you can pick your size, um, you can, pay a little bit extra and have it shipped directly to you. Um, but if you don't want to, I'll be picking it up and taking it to either a meeting or the Rotary office for you to pick up. Um, so it's a great, great chance to, to show our Rotary pride. So I encourage you to, to shop. Thanks. Okay, it looks like Sergeant Arms. Rich Austin, but first of all, as you're coming up here, Rich, come on up. I want to I want to put on my bulletproof Sergeant of Arms vest. It's not going to work. Uh-oh, he says it's not going to work. So I don't know if you have noticed that most of the year, Rich wears a vest. So I thought if I wore one today that I might get out of being fine, but maybe it'll double. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. President, or should I say, Professor Fairbrook. Um, with football season starting tonight and school starting, depending on what school you go to, uh, within the last two weeks or in the next two weeks, thought it was time to teach Cooper Cup 101. And I'm your TA, Rich Austin. You can just call me Rich, and I feel bad saying this, but unlike Professor Fairbrook, I do not require you to call me Sir or Your Highness. This class will focus on the life and career of the top receiver in the NFL, Yakima's own Cooper Cup, MVP of Super Bowl 56. If you look to the bottom right, there's a photo over here of a great NFL player working with a Hall of Famer. And I'd just like to, to know how exciting it was for Peyton Manning to meet Cooper. <laughs> Today we'll feature four sections, each focusing on a period of Cooper's life and having two multiple choice questions. However, you will not be graded. If you are wrong, you'll simply pay a dollar for each wrong answer. Let's get started. Question one, Cooper was not his original first name. What was his parents' initial choice? A, Chris, B, Cody, C, Colton, or D, Corey? Answer is B, Cody. Cooper's dad, Craig, said they had chosen Cody as a first name, but he and wife Karen were filling out the birth certificate form, and Craig said, what do you think about Cooper? And the rest is history. Everyone knows Cooper attended Davis High School in the Yakima School District, but where did he go to middle school? A, Franklin, B, Lewis and Clark, C, Washington, or D, Wilson? Answer is D, Wilson. The Cup family lived on the west side of Yakima, and it was a foregone conclusion that he would attend Ike. But he was very interested in the baccalaureate program at Davis and decided to become a pirate. Let's move on to section two, Cooper Cup, the college years. A two-way all-state selection, Cooper earned all-state honors as both a defensive back 
and a wide receiver, although defensive back he was first team, his only honorable mention as wide receiver by those foolish writers, Associated Press. He finished a senior season with 60 receptions, over 1,000 yards receiving, and 18 touchdowns, and a school record 22 total TDs. Leads us to question three. After his prep career, how many college football offers did Cooper receive? A0, B1, C2, or D3? Answer is zero. Can you believe after a great high school career he did not receive his first, first college scholarship offer until three weeks after his college season ended to Eastern Washington University? He sat out his first year and became a starter as a redshirt freshman, and that became one of the most storied careers in college football history. How many times was Cooper named a first-team All-American at Eastern? A1, B2, C3, or D4? Answer, D4. Here are just a few accolades Cooper received during his career at Eastern. He's the uh, all-division career leader in receiving yards, um, the FCS College Football Series career leader in receiving touchdowns and receptions. As we mentioned, a four-time All-American, more importantly, a three-time academic All-American. Section three, Yakima to the NFL. After Eastern, Cooper attended the Senior Bowl where he was named the top prospect. The LA Rams selected him in the third round, 69th pick overall of the 17 NFL draft, and he joined his grandfather Jake and father Craig as NFL draftees. How many receivers were taken before Cooper in the 2017 NFL draft? A0, B4, C7, or D9? Answer is C7. Cooper was the seventh receiver taken in the draft after some of these famous names. Number three pick, Corey Davis. Number fifth, five pick, Mike Williams. Number seven, John Ross of the University of Washington, Harry Hellison's favorite. Um, and John Ross has put up great career numbers. He had 11 touchdowns, or has 11 touchdowns through his uh, career. Cooper had that after 12 games last year. He has 957 yards, um, and Cooper beat that after nine games last year. Go Huskies, right, Harry? Cooper now wears number 10, his Eastern member. What number did he first wear in the NFL? A12, B18, C80, or D88? Answer is B18. After a few seasons, he changed his jersey back to number 10, which was his college number at Eastern, and his basketball number at Davis. Section four, one for the record books. He's had an amazing NFL career, but he had an all-time great season last year with the Rams. Question seven, Cooper became only the fourth player in NFL history to win this honor. Name it, A, MVP, B, wide receiver of the year, C, triple crown, uh, receiving triple crown, or D, man of the year. Sorry about that. Answer is C, receiving triple crown. His performance in 2021 was one of the greatest statistical receiving seasons in NFL history. He received the NFL receiving triple crown, becoming the first player since 2005 to lead the league in receptions, receiving yards, and, rece and um, receiving touchdowns, and was only the fourth player in NFL history to do that. He was named NFL Offensive Player of the Year, and no offense to um, Bob Gerst or our newest member, Sarah, he should have been named the MVP. Cooper became the first wide receiver to win the Super Bowl um, MVP without leading in what category? A, receiving yards, B, catches, C, all-purpose yards, or should say D, targets. Answer is A, receiving yards. In Super Bowl 56 against the Bengals, Cooper had eight catches for 92 yards and, and two touchdowns. And on the game-winning drive, he ran for seven yards on a critical fourth and one play and caught the game-winning touchdown. You've all now passed Cooper Cup 101, and you're an expert on the NFL's best wide receiver, Yakima's own Cooper Cup. What a great young man and a great career, and he's only 29 years old. He recently signed an $80 million contract extension to keep him with the Rams through 2026. The Yakima Valley, the Yakima School District, and our youth are lucky to have a person like Cooper represent our community. And the Rams start defending their championship tonight against the Buffalo Bills. 
please make sure to watch number 10 as he continues to make us all proud. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. Uh, he is a gem for, for Yakima, uh, academically, physically. I, I'm, I'm impressed how he studies. He studies the game. He studies his, oppon his opponents and, and thinks how he's going to improve, and it's uh, pretty impressive. Okay, we are now moving to uh, our speaker introduction, which will come from David Links. Thank you, Rick. Good afternoon. The Larson Gallery was one of the first three buildings built on the present site of the campus of Yakima Valley College in 1949. I wasn't there then, but I heard about it. During the first season from 1949 to 1950, the Larson Gallery held an exhibit of the Women Painters of Washington. This group was founded in 1930 by a group of six women artists. The founding members of the Women Painters of Washington joined together to overcome the limitations they faced as female artists and to stimulate artistic growth through fellowship. Their goal was to create an organization that would promote individual growth for female artists while at the same time nurturing a strong fellowship among its members. Women Painters of Washington has worked diligently to create opportunities for artistic growth and to encourage creative expression for women. During my tenure at Larson Gallery, I've had the pleasure of exhibiting their work in 2015. Now at our new location, we have a brand new exhibit of 55 artworks on exhibit titled Intersections. This exhibit was curated by Monica Miller, Executive Directory, uh, Director of Gallery One. Monica Miller has worked with arts organizations for over 20 years in fundraising, grants management, and professional development for artists. Monica's primary responsibility is to ensure that Gallery One is relevant to the community it serves. One of her favorite parts of her role is a co-curator with Renee Adams. Together they strive to create a dynamic exhibition schedule that represents different voices, skill levels, and ultimately creates community connections. She was recently recognized by the Ellensburg Daily Record Person of the Year for her work at the Gallery One during the pandemic and currently serves on the Ellensburg City Council. I will first introduce you to Susan Walker, an artist with the Women Painters of Washington. Susan Walker has a BA in Studio Art from the University of California, Davis, and a master's degree from Seattle Pacific University. She is a working artist who creates representational oil paintings, most recently using drone images as reference photos. Susan is on the board of directors of Women Painters of Washington and a signature member with American Women Artists. Will you please welcome Susan Walker. Hello, Rotari Rotarians, correct? All right. <laughs> oh, thank you. It's an honor to be here, represent Women Painters of Washington, and to speak to you all today. So when I was setting up with Carolyn and getting the PowerPoint or the deck ready to go, um, one of the staff that was helping said, I said, well, I'm an artist, I'm the speaker, and she's like, oh, I could never do that. And I was... <laughs> thinking that is the most common thing when I tell people that I meet or talk to my friends. I'm an artist like, oh, I could never do that. You're so talented. I can't draw. I only do stick figures. And I'm here to tell you, anyone can learn how to draw. It's just if you want to, like in any of your given professions. You have to have the desire and the determination. And so, when I look at these women, this is a 1930s photo of women painters of Washington. These are women that were my grandmother's age. Um, these women shared the same fire in their brain that I do, which is, what do you do with this thing that wants to make with your hands? You're a maker. You're a creative. That doesn't mean to me that anyone in any other profession is not creative, but we call ourselves creatives, I don't know why that came, and makers. And I, I just love to have my hands going. So these women felt the same way. They're not hobbyists. They had to do something sort of bigger um, and more consistent than, um, than that. And so, um, 
in was it 19, yeah, 1930, there were six women and two men that signed up for a portraiture class in Seattle at this man, H.C. Henry's home, and he was a railroad baron. And you can see already, or at least I could when I looked at this, that this is, the, the arts in the early days of Seattle was definitely um, for people with wealth, wealth and privilege. They had the time, unlike my great-grandparents who were working class, who just survival was everything. This generation of Seattleites had some time and resources. Um, and in 1928, the men formed and excluded women, the Puget Sound Northwest Painters Group. And so these six women, these are two of them, but it just kind of puts it in time and place to see photos of them in that era. They decided, well, we're going to need to start a women's group then, Women Painters of Washington. And so it started as a luncheon and um, evolved into this mission statement. And I was reading it to do the research for this, and I thought, Dang, that is exactly what I still need in my career as an artist. I need someone that will continue to promote my own learning. I need fellowship with other artists because, again, like in your given professions, there's sort of a language or a jargon that goes with, I mean, who else is going to want to talk about substrate or um, a fil do you use a filbert or a broad brush with that? So, so there's a, a fellowship needed. And then... There's a, a desire to exchange that is sell paintings in our case or just exchange goods, trade services with the greater community. And then beyond that, like this speech, foster awareness out in the general community. And I was like, read that and I'm like, that is exactly why I joined Women Painters. Not, not much has changed. So the original group had 25 charter members, and they went on to be the founders of what became the Seattle Arts Museum. And so the cornerstone of the building at the Seattle Art Museum has the signature of our uh, first president on it. And we have had over the 90 years, 11, about 11,000, 1,100 members have, have moved through. During the war, um, the women painters were very active in fundraising. Um, one of the members was really involved with the Cooley Dam project. And then there were people like Yvonne um, Humber that decided to endow women painters, $50,000 back in, 1940-ish, and it's still um, an endowment that we use as part of our organization. Now we use it to uh, grant awards, which our juror, Monica, will be awarding this afternoon at the gallery, or at least choosing who gets what. Um, and that money comes in part from this bequest from this original member. So this is what we look like now. <laughs> this is some of us um, up at our last exhibit up in LaConnor at, at uh, the Matsky Fine Art Gallery there. We are a nonprofit organization. We're on the board. I'm on the board. We have 180 members now. We have a monthly meeting, which we've been doing by Zoom, that we do business like you just did with yours. And then we have a lecture like, like you're doing here, only yours are usually related to the arts. It's an all-volunteer effort. And we are, um, there's a vetting process for joining where, um, oh, that's my cue. <laughs> Speed it up. Um, uh, to be selected to be in Women Painters. We have a gallery in the Columbia Tower building um, in downtown Seattle. And then my friend and colleague, Carol Ross, who was introduced to you earlier, our, our uh, job on the board is to host or organize uh, juried ex exhibitions. So you have to be juried in to this show that's at the Larson Gallery, Chosen. Um, and we go all over the state, including Eastern Washington. We make a point of coming here every other year. Um, 
And there's the Larson Gallery and the show, Intersections, which opens um, this Saturday. And Monica is going to speak to you in just a moment here. I want to segue into Monica's chat um, by saying, as a juror, she has, in this particular case, had 132 pieces of art to narrow down into 40 to 50, 42 different artists. You know, how does she choose? She's very skilled. She's got um, two degrees in art. And still, I have to ask myself, because I'm an oil painter, I do representational work, but the range of what artists do is huge. And so I'm like, Monica, tell us how you make those decisions. That's what I'm most interested in. So let me present to you Monica Miller. She's the director of Gallery One in Ellensburg. Monica. Let's just change that slide real quick. <laughs> ah, hi. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. Um, actually, I want to start off first by uh, thanking you for your service. Coming to this uh, meeting reminded me, and thinking about my past and how I got here, that in 1995, fresh out of high school, I was awarded a small scholarship to apply toward my undergraduate degree at William and Mary by the Rotarians in Arlington, Virginia. And here I am now. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I did uh, start going to college. I, I thought I was going to be pre-law, but that didn't work out so well. I ended up uh, getting my degree in ceramics and English lit. Um, the classes were a little early for me. The law classes, it was like 7.30 or something. But anyways, I'm really happy to be here. As was mentioned, I am the executive director of Gallery One. And also to, um, to the invocation earlier about inviting people to the table, I can't be here in Yakima and talk about you know, how I've gotten here without thanking the, a former director of the Larson Gallery, Carol Hassan who without her mentorship and invitation to the table, I also wouldn't be here. I don't know if any of you know Carol, but after leaving the Larson, she moved to Gallery One. <laughs> it's really nice to be able to thank her here, so thank you for that. Uh, as the director of Gallery One, I wear many hats. Gallery, how many of you have been to Ellensburg, uh, Gallery One in Ellensburg? Cool. Thank you for visiting. For those of you who haven't, I'd like to invite you. There's a newsletter on the table uh, that gives you a sense of what we are doing in the upcoming quarter. In addition to exhibits, we also offer classes for kids and adults. We do a lot of outreach in Kittitas County and the schools. We have a program called art to go where we provide kits for art making to the teachers. With They're all encompassing with uh, Spanish translated instruction as well as video instruction and all the materials that they need to plug lessons into their arts-based learning standards that are set by the state. So in addition to our beautiful historic building from 1889 on Pearl Street, we are also in the community as much as possible as I am here today. So I invite you to stop by and visit us. So as the director, I do a lot of you know, fundraising, community outreach, uh, work with the board for strategic planning, of course. But one of my favorite things that I get to do is, as mentioned, co-curate our exhibits in our main gallery. We actually have four gallery spaces. So we're rotating exhibits all year long, and our goal is to show a variety of work from emerging artists and professional artists, from moms, dads, and their kids. We're really there to show how art can create a community through bringing them together into this space through that endeavor of being creative and using your hands and connecting with one another. So please come and visit us and experience that for yourself. Being a curator or a juror is a very sexy job, right? People are, oh, I want to be a curator. 
I'm going to be a curator at a museum. I'm going to select the artwork. I'm going to hang it on the wall. So that's the perception of it. It's a little bit different from the, <laughs> from the other side, especially if you really care about people and people's feelings, because people's feelings can be hurt uh, when you <laughs> decide that their work is not good enough. So that's why at the gallery I mentioned, we really try to have a whole range of uh, entry points to exhibiting your artwork. So just to say, there are many entry points for you as well. If you would like to submit a piece of work to show at the gallery, we have our member show at the beginning of the year. We also have opened up our, and annually it's pretty common for a, a gallery or an arts organization to do a regional call to showcase the artists in their community. And for years, for years, we jury the show we invited an outside juror and not everybody got in and that was super uncomfortable finally i think four years ago 2018 for a 50th anniversary we we're like you know what let's just let everybody in <laughs> let's not do this anymore so we decided everybody gets at least one piece in and that really i think opened up people's hearts to the concept of showing their work because they knew that they would not be judged. Now, I'm not saying everybody does it. No, but not everybody does this. That's what I'm saying. Not everybody does this. But for us, it, it felt better in terms of creating community connections. And then we were able to celebrate excellence in other ways through awards. And I think Washington Women's Painters of Washington also are doing that. And, and that was an approach that I I brought to this is that everybody who wants to put themselves out there deserves to be recognized and to be seen. So in this exhibit, you'll see every artist who submitted their work will be in the show. And I'm looking forward to seeing who you know, gets some money <laughs> and hopefully not get their feelings hurt. Um, so what I wanted to do with you guys for a couple of minutes here is kind of share my process of selecting works. Because even though everybody got a piece of work in the show, they didn't get all of their works in the show because it's up to the juror or the curator to decide what story they want to tell through the works that they are looking at. And, and that's the job. That's really the job of it, is to ask questions. So before I, I do that, what I, oh, I have this. OK, I was going to ask somebody else. Which way does it go? Oh, OK, great. OK, so one of the first things I do, you get the work. It could be 150 works. When I juried, co-juried the exhibit in Titan, the small work show a couple of years ago, uh, when I juried our, our exhibits at Gallery One, the first thing I do is just get an at a glance, kind of what, what's going on here? What do we have? And you don't need a, a long time to look at things. It's like, OK, all right, got that piece. OK, that's going on there. OK, that's kind of interesting behind his butt. OK, um, what, what's happening here? Who's that? So I just that's it. I do that for whatever, an hour. I, it happens. <laughs> you saw it, right? The hands behind the back. Um, so I ask. So then I go back. Okay, I kind of. My mind is registering, I'm, I'm taking it in, and then I'll go back to the beginning. Oop, try not to go back that far. Um, and I ask myself, you know, word association, what did I see? So go ahead, ask yourself these questions when you're looking at this work. What do you see? What do you feel? What questions come to mind? What are you curious about? And then I start to think, and, and you too, are there any similarities or connectors? Are there any major differences? And is there a story to tell. Now, at first glance, they feel pretty different. And I did that on purpose. 
Would anybody be interested in sharing a similarity that you are observing? Noel, David. <laughs> you help your Rotarians out here? They're like, oh my God, no, I don't. Oh, texture. Vertical? Who said vertical? Nice. Disconnect. Exactly. So that's the disconnect and the vertical is kind of where I started and what I started feeling. And it was kind of a rough week, I think, uh, at work when I. <laughs> <laughs> when I got these images and I wasn't sure if that was coming from me or if it was coming from the work but I immediately started connecting with you know this concept and you know again the invocation is so beautiful at the beginning this concept of like women and the disconnect between so many different uh, who we are how we're supposed to be in the world how we want to be in the world who tells us how to be being told what to do and what not to do and that was my headspace but visually these pieces they brought me there because you've got these at least for the first three pieces you'll see think the frame is being bifurcated in some way it's being interrupted it's disjointed and then for this fourth piece, there's not that obvious uh, bifurcation, but there is there's a, a scattering of the image. You really have to look into it and dig into it. So for me, that's how I approached this exhibit. And I'll end by inviting you to be the judge yourself by attending either an exhibit at Gallery One over the next year and the opening on Saturday to view these works. What time? Three From three to five. Thank you. I guess I'm one of those who uh, feels he can't be an artist, stick figures, but maybe I could be motivated to make something out of those stick figures. But anyway, thank you. I uh, appreciate the uh, opinion of an uh, art juror. That is uh, very interesting. Thank you, Monica. So uh, next week, whoops, I want to say this first. We give a speaker gift on your behalf to um, Rotary Polio Plus campaign. So uh, you'll be, your appearance here will benefit Polio Plus uh, um, operatives in, uh, throughout the world. So thank you. Next week's program, uh, Sister Kathleen Ross and Dr. Andrew Sund. Um, they're going to talk about Heritage, Heritage University, no surprise there, 40 years of creating higher education opportunities in the Yakima Valley. It's an amazing story. We have, I mean, they have a university in Toppenish, Washington. Pretty incredible. On the 22nd, Neil Barg, the year of the virus. I have to think that's going to be very interesting. I don't know how technical it's going to be. Neil can be pretty technical. He's a, he's a pretty smart guy. Uh, I know him personally, and I'm looking forward to that presentation. And if you have questions, that would be a good time to uh, uh, hopefully have an opportunity to ask them. And on the 29th, uh, we're going to have a Rotary reunion. And you, as a Rotarian, are invited to attend. And this is going to be a little different. It's going to be on a Thursday, but it's not going to be at noon. It will be here, but it's going to be from 4 to 6. And we're going to start with the social hour from 4 to 5, and then we'll have a program from 5 to 6. Uh, the program right now uh, looks like it consists of, uh, we'll, have, we'll have five different classes. You'll find yourself in a certain class depending on when you came into Rotary. We have one class that's, that spans 1956 to 1992. And there are just as many members in that class as there is the class, and I can't remember exactly, the, I think it's 2018 to 2022. 60 some members in each of those classes. So uh, each class is going to have an opportunity to have a, a sergeant of arms, 
Uh, they'll have a music presentation. And uh, right now we're thinking we might crown a king and queen of the reunion. So be there. Um, and don't worry, it, it's not by popular uh, uh, selection. It's, uh, it'll be random, but it'll be fun to see how it works out. So put that on your calendar. We'd like to have every Rotarian who can attend be here. The more the merrier. Hopefully we'll see Rotarians we haven't seen in a long time. And that's the whole idea, bring us back together. Get socialized first, and then we'll have our, hopefully, a fun meeting. After this meeting, there is a membership committee meeting. David Cobia and Brad Hansen back in the corner there. Um, my golly, I think that's it. We are adjourned. Oh, pick up a sign as you leave.